Wanna hear a tall tale? Come inside and hear about my broken records. 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 Tennis, anyone? I'll see you in court. Quit horsing around. Race inside to find out how movies began. I'm sure my name will ring a bell. Call on me inside. <laughs> Hustling across a court to toss a large round ball through a high hoop is a relatively young sport. But since its invention by James A. Naismith in 1891, basketball has become one of the most widely played and watched sports in the world. Naismith wanted an indoor game for his students at the Springfield Training School in Bloomfield, Massachusetts. So he combined the Indian game of lacrosse with the English game of soccer and invented basketball. He instituted dribbling and passing, and he used a wooden peach basket for a goal. Today, of course, we use a net and a rim attached to a backboard. If there's no basket available, a peach basket will still do just fine. But be sure to take out the peaches first. He was six foot three when he was 12 years old and was seven foot one when he went to college to play basketball for the Kansas Jayhawks in 1956. Before his career was over, Wilt the Stilt Chamberlain broke more records than any other player in basketball history. He began his professional career in 1958, playing guard for the Harlem Globetrotters. He was so successful that the very next year he signed on with his hometown team, the NBA Philadelphia Warriors. He connected with more than seven of every ten shots he took from the floor in his rookie year, still an NBA record. Wilt later broke records by scoring 100 points in a single game. That's the average final score for an entire team. In 1972, he led the L.A. Lakers to a record-breaking 69-win, 13-loss season. In his 14 years in the NBA, Wilt Chamberlain racked up over 31,000 points and pulled down almost 24,000 rebounds, all records. crack of a bat as it lifts a small white ball high into space. A cloud of dirt as a runner slides into home plate. All this and more makes baseball one of America's most popular sports. But is it really American? It's said that Abner Doubleday invented baseball in Cooperstown, New York in 1839. But a very similar game was played in England in the 18th century. Not only that, but an English book published in 1828 describes a game called Rounder that was played on a diamond with four bases and had strikeouts, fouls, and home runs. And the runner could be thrown out by being hit with the ball. Rounder is so close to baseball that today we think it's probably where baseball came from. But Abner Doubleday made baseball so popular in the United States that it's called America's national pastime. Fortunately, modern players don't have to be hit by the ball to be called out. Over the years, there have been some truly great baseball players. Click on a picture to find out who these players are and what makes them so great. Ty Cobb had the highest lifetime batting average in the major leagues. He hit 367 in 5,000 turns at bat. In 1973, Nolan Ryan pitched the most strikeouts in a season, 383. The next year, he tied for the most strikeouts in a game, 19. Jackie Robinson was the first black player in the major leagues. He started as a Brooklyn Dodger in 1946. Lou Gehrig played in 2,130 consecutive games, 
and hit over 300 for 12 years. Cy Young was a pitcher who was famous for pitching the most entire games, 751. Today, the Cy Young Award is given to the best pitcher of the season. Babe Ruth hit 60 home runs in one season, including a 587-foot smash in a 1919 game against the Boston Red Sox. Lou Brock holds the record for the most stolen bases in a lifetime. He stole 938 of them from 1961 to 1979. Hank Aaron had 755 home runs in his career, the most ever. He also had the most runs batted in, 2,297. The fiercely competitive practice of slamming a tennis ball over a net is one of the oldest sports around, perhaps originating in ancient Egypt and Persia. By 1300, it was known as La Baude, and it was popular in France in the 1400s. The kings of France and England were such enthusiastic tennis players that it became known as the Royal Game. King Henry VIII even built a tennis court in 1529 that's still used today. Tennis was being played regularly in the United States in the late 1800s. The game as we play it now was invented in Wales in 1873 by Walter Wingfield. Lawn tennis is played on grass courts, but tennis can also be played on asphalt or clay. Today there are several famous international tournaments, and one of the most important is at Wimbledon, England. By the way, the name tennis probably comes from the French word tenez, meaning take it, play. The way tennis is scored may seem a little strange at first, but it's easy to understand once you get the hang of it. You get points every time the person you're playing against fails to return the ball from his side of the court into yours. Points are counted 0, 15, 30, 40, and game. If the game is tied at 40, 40, which is called deuce, the first player to win two more points in a row wins the game. The first person to win six games wins a set. In championship play, two out of three sets wins a match in women's tennis, and three out of five wins for men. And one more thing. When someone has no score or zero, it's called love. This term comes from the French word l'oeuf, meaning the egg, because an egg looks like a zero. It's fall. The air is crisp, and torpedo-shaped pigskin balls are flying through the air. Though today's football season comes in the autumn, people have been playing similar games all year round since the time of the ancient Romans. The Romans taught a football game to the English, who've been playing their version, soccer, for centuries. Football, as we know it, began in England in 1823 when a soccer player named William Webb Ellis missed a kick. Angry at his own mistake, he picked up the ball and ran with it down the field. His embarrassed team captain apologized for his unsportsmanlike behavior, but somehow the idea caught on. In England, his version of football is called rugby, named after the rugby school he attended. But in the United States, it's called football. The modern rules of football were first introduced by Glenn Pop Warner in the 1910s. Each of the 11 members of a football team has a different job to do. Click on any of the players to find out what they do during the game. The safeties and cornerbacks are the fastest men on the defensive team. They have to keep up with the other team's pass receivers one-on-one -on -one and keep them from catching the ball. The linebackers are the team's second line of defense. That's why they're also called the secondary. They have to block the other team's passes and tackle receivers and runners that make it past the defensive line. 
This is the defensive line. Their job is to go wherever the ball is and tackle the player on the other team who has it, and they can hit him hard. These guys are called the offensive line, and not because they have bad table manners. They keep the other team from getting to the quarterback, and they make holes in the defensive line for their running backs to go through. The wide receiver's job is to run at lightning speeds down the field and catch passes in their skillful hands. Tight ends have to be both tough and accurate. They've got to catch balls and block the other team's linebackers. The quarterback is probably the most important man on the field because he handles the ball on every play. He gives it to the runners, throws it, and sometimes even runs with it himself. These are the running backs, and you guessed it, their job is to take the ball and run with it. They also block and catch passes. Though cabbage today may be the center of attention when it comes to coleslaw at a picnic, for many, many years it was considered a useless plant, something like a weed. Cabbage grew wild along the seacoast in different parts of ancient Europe, but for years people never tasted it or realized how good it was to eat. Today's cabbage has one central bud and leaves that grow tightly over it to form a large, solid head. Red and white cabbages have smooth leaves. And you might be surprised that over 150 other plants have been bred from cabbage. For instance, Brussels sprouts are like miniature cabbages with a stalk and both small and large leaves. When we eat cauliflower, we're not really eating the leaves, but the flower bud that's formed into a solid mass with a few loose leaves around it. The Italians thought that cauliflower was too hard to grow, so they developed broccoli. For nearly as long as the human race has existed, people have told stories of their lives in pictures, often in the most unusual places. The Stone Age people of Europe first drew lifelike images of prehistoric animals on their caves 35,000 years ago. The first cave art was discovered in 1875. Since then, over 100 decorated caves have been found, mostly in France and Spain. One of the most famous caves is Lascaux in the south of France. It was found accidentally in 1940 by boys playing in the area. There are several rooms in the Lascaux cave, including the chamber of cats, filled with drawings of cats, and a room called the Shaft of the Dead Man, showing a man caught between a bison and a rhinoceros. Lascaux is now closed to the public but people can still see other cave paintings in France, Spain, and many other places. Thousands of years after cavemen recorded their experiences on the walls of their caves, Egyptians were painting images on the walls of their tombs. Since they believed in life after death, they often painted the most important things in a man's life like his family and possessions. The ancient Greeks were some of the most artistic people of any age. Rather than reproduce lifelike things, they painted and sculpted ideal forms in their figures of gods and goddesses. When Christianity became a major force, it brought flat designs and symbolic ideas. Now art was no longer natural or ideal. It was filled with religious subjects. During the medieval era from 500 to 1500, beautifully painted books were made by hand. Today you can see a little bit of everything at your local art museum. But some of the most modern art still reflects the ideas of our earliest ancestors.
Today, you can just click a button and out pops a photograph that comes to life right in your hand. But the first camera didn't actually make pictures, it helped people draw them. The camera obscura, used from the 11th to 16th centuries, projected an image onto paper to be traced by an artist. In 1802, Thomas Wedgwood made silhouettes of small natural objects onto paper by covering it with silver nitrate and exposing it to light. But he never found a way to make these prints permanent. Joseph Niepce made the first photographic image with a camera and lens in 1816. He produced a negative or reverse image and a few years later successfully produced a positive image on a metal plate. Finally, in 1835, Henry Fox Talbot learned how to make permanent paper photographs. Photography was a very expensive hobby until 1888, when the popular Kodak box camera was introduced, turning anyone and everyone into a snapshooter. Maybe you've seen those fragile, shiny pictures from the 19th century called daguerreotypes. They're named after Louis Daguerre, who perfected a way of freezing a camera's image onto a coated metal plate. Having a picture taken in those days was a long and boring process. You had to stay completely still for several minutes, or else the picture would be blurry. People usually sat down while a head clasp on a stand behind them held their heads steady. When the Kodak box camera came out, everyone became a photographer. But did you know that the entire camera had to be sent back to Kodak for the pictures to be developed? Kodak then developed the pictures, reloaded the camera, and sent everything back. Did you know that the first motion picture was made to win a bet? In 1879, a California stable owner wanted to prove that a galloping horse lifted all four legs off the ground at once, but it was too fast to be seen by the naked eye. So he hired Edward Mybridge to take a series of photographs. Mybridge laid wires across a racetrack. Those wires triggered a bank of 24 cameras as the horse went running by. And indeed, the photos proved that the stable owner was right. Mybridge even constructed a machine he called a zoopraxiscope, which projected these images on a screen one right after another. The first film that really told a story, The Great Train Robbery, was made in the laboratories of Thomas Edison in 1903. Pittsburgh was home to the first permanent movie theater in 1905. It only cost a nickel to get in, so they called it a Nickelodeon. You can make your own movie or series of still pictures that move, and you don't even need a movie camera or film. It's called a flip book. To make one, you'll need something to draw with, and either a memo pad or ten or so small pieces of paper. Click on the numbers when you're ready to begin. A movie is just a series of single frames, each with a slightly different picture. Our movie is going to be about a bird bursting a balloon. Start with the first picture. Draw the balloon rising from the bottom of the page. Now, draw several pictures of the balloon on its way up the page. On your next drawing, add the bird flying in from the right. Draw several more pictures, moving the bird closer to the balloon in each one. Draw the bird's beak hitting the balloon. Now you need a small burst as the balloon pops, with the bird looking startled. Or you can make up your own ending. Put the pages together with a staple or a paper clip, but make sure that your pages go in order from first to last. Now, quickly flip the pages with your thumb. See how the pictures move? You can color in your flip book and make it like a real movie. Before Thomas Edison made the first sound recording in 1877, the only ways to hear music were to go to a concert or to play it yourself. Edison's recording machine had a cylinder that was turned by a hand crank 
as well as a horn that collected the sound, much the way cupping your hand over your ear collects sound. At the other end of the horn was a blunted needle called a stylus. The cylinder was covered with tin foil and the stylus pressed against this foil. When the cylinder was cranked, it turned round and round, making the stylus draw grooves in the foil. At the same time, sound waves entered the horn and made the stylus vibrate. It made a bigger groove when the sound was loud and a smaller groove with softer sounds. These grooves represented the pattern of sound waves made by someone talking or singing. When I left my country, my born... The greatest recording in the world doesn't mean a thing if you can't play it back. Edison accomplished playback by moving the stylus and horn back to the beginning of the groove. The cylinder was then cranked and turned, and the air in the horn vibrated just as it had when the recording was made. That moving air made a sound, duplicating the original recording. When Edison perfected his invention on that cold winter day in 1877, he tried it out by recording this well-known nursery rhyme. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Do you realize that when you talk on the phone, you're using a device that was invented by accident? On June 2nd, 1875, Alexander Graham Bell was experimenting with a way of sending several messages over a single telegraph wire. Bell was receiving telegraph signals that Thomas Watson, his assistant, was sending from the next room. Their homemade telegraph sets were constructed from unwound clock springs made out of spring steel. Suddenly, Bell heard a twanging sound on his set. Watson had just plucked one of the springs on his set, making it vibrate. That vibration had sent a current over the wire, causing the spring on Bell's set to vibrate too. Forty short weeks later, the telephone was perfected. On March 10, 1876, Bell used his new invention to call his assistant from the workshop, two floors below, speaking the now famous words, Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. Today, you can talk on the phone from your car or from an airplane. How do some of these newer phones work? Well, car phones work on radio waves, which are electromagnetic waves that travel through space. Other telephones use a different kind of electromagnetic wave called microwaves, which either travel between relay towers or are bounced off orbiting communication satellites. One of the newest and most important ways to transmit phone conversations is with fiber optics. These thin, flexible glass threads transmit laser light and can be expected to give more than 100 years of continuous operation. A pair of fiber optic cables can carry up to 672 conversations. A cable of 144 fibers can carry nearly 50,000 phone calls at the same time and a four and a half pound spool of fibers can do the same job as 200 spools of traditional copper wire weighing over 16,000 pounds. You may think that the Liberty Bell cracked from being rung too many times, but actually it cracked the first time it was struck when it was delivered to the Pennsylvania State House in 1752. It was recast and repaired and finally hung again the next year. The bell remained in one piece throughout the Revolutionary War, ringing out on July 18, 1776 to proclaim the adoption of the Declaration of Independence and in 1783 to announce the end of the Revolutionary War. From then on, it was rung on every July 4th, as well as to mark special occasions. In 1835, the bell cracked again, and again it was repaired. Finally, during the 1846 celebration of George Washington's birthday, 
the Liberty Bell cracked its last time. No one was able to fix it. It was taken down and set up for display in the Tower of Independence Hall in 1915. Today it's still there for anyone to see, crack and all. Did you ever wonder how the Liberty Bell got its name? When it was first made, it was just another bell with no special meaning or name. It became a symbol of American independence during the Revolutionary War, but it wasn't called the Liberty Bell until the mid-1800s, a hundred years after it was made. At that time, the abolitionists, people who wanted to free the slaves, were very active in Philadelphia, where the bell was hanging. People in Pennsylvania believed so strongly in liberty for slaves that they named the bell for their cause. Ever since then, it's been called the Liberty Bell. Money may be the root of all evil, but did you know that the early Romans coined their money in a temple? You see, they believed that the goddess Juno warned them of approaching dangers. They were so grateful for her warnings that they made her the guardian of finances. They called her Juno Moneta, from the Latin word moneo, meaning to warn. And that's the origin of our word money. The word coin also comes from the ancient Romans. They used the word cuneus, which means wedge, because their money was wedge-shaped. How did other countries name their coin of the realm? Click on the money to see. The dollar started in Bohemia, where the silver used for money was mined from a place called Joachimsthaler. In time, this became taler, then dollar. Dime comes from the Latin word decimus, meaning tenth. A dime is one-tenth of a dollar. This is easy. The nickel was originally made of the metal nickel. Cent comes from the French word cent, meaning 100. There are 100 cents in a dollar. The English pound comes from the Latin word pondo. It also meant pound, but was used as a measurement of weight. The Mexican peso was also originally a unit of weight. So was the Italian lira. This French franc is named after the Latin words francorum rex, king of the francs. The French used to be called francs, and this phrase was printed on old French coins. If you've never been to a bridal shower, you might be surprised to learn that you don't need an umbrella or a bathing suit to attend. A bridal shower is a party that's given for an engaged woman where she gets lots of gifts for her new home. It started in Holland many years ago when a young girl wanted to marry a poor miller. Her father was against the marriage. He said that if she married the miller, he would not give her a dowry, wedding money and gifts. Luckily, the miller had many friends. They all went to the girl's house, showering her with presents like kitchen utensils and linens. Now that the couple had all the things they needed to set up housekeeping, they were able to get married after all. That was the first bridal shower, and it has become a custom that's remained with us ever since. Marriage has been with us for quite a while. So it's not surprising that many of today's wedding customs come from ancient times. For instance, those fancy towers of sweetness that we call wedding cakes go back to Roman times when rich families celebrated a wedding with a special cake. It's even said that a piece of the cake was broken over the bride's head as a symbol of abundance to come from the marriage. Each guest took a piece of cake too, so they could also have good fortune in their lives. The next time you have a piece of wedding cake, think of good times to come in your life and be grateful they don't break the cake over the bride's head anymore.
Did you know that playing cards were once used to tell the future? They were introduced thousands of years ago. No one knows exactly where. It could have been in China, Egypt, or even India. Cards similar to those we use today were created in Italy around the 13th century. They were called tarot cards. This 22-card deck was used for both fortune-telling and simple games. Over time, the deck grew to 78 cards, with four suits and four court, or royal, cards. The French cut the deck down to 52 cards, keeping the royal king, queen, and knave, or jack. In the 17th century, they replaced the tarot's four suits with clubs, diamonds, hearts, and spades. Early cards were very expensive because they were handmade, but with the invention of printing, everyone could afford to have a deck. Today's picture cards still show people wearing outfits from the 15th century. In some games, the two jokers in your deck are more valuable than any other card. In others, you don't use them at all. Jokers come from the Italian tarot deck. One of the cards was called Il Matto, the Fool, and that's the one we now call the Joker. Today's Joker still wears outfits that the court jesters wore centuries ago. Court jesters were clowns for kings and queens. They made the members of the court forget their troubles with jokes, tricks, and odd-looking multicolored clothing. Before Samuel Morse invented the telegraph in 1837, people had to trust all sorts of methods to deliver messages quickly over long distances. But Morse didn't just invent the telegraph. He also created the Morse code, a standard system of sending letters and numbers over telegraph wires. Morse code consists of a series of short sounds called dots, like this, and long sounds called dashes, like this. They're made by using a switch to interrupt a continuous electrical current. Together, dots and dashes make up letters and words. Here's a famous signal in Morse code. It's the letters SOS, which stand for Save Our Ship. SOS is the International Emergency Signal. Although these days long-distance communication is done by telephone, fax, or computer modems, Morse code is still used for some ship-to-shore transmissions and in amateur radio. Whenever you shrug your shoulders or nod your head, you're using sign language to express yourself. People who are hearing impaired cannot always understand normal talking and their speech is often unclear. These people use sign language much of the time. The origins of sign language for the deaf are hard to pin down. We know for sure that by 1755, Abbe de Lepe was teaching it in his school for the deaf in Paris. His system eventually became the manual alphabet. Manual means hand, and in the manual alphabet, Finger positions represent letters. Some people can spell out words at the rate of 130 a minute. Today, sign language is a system of signs that stand for whole words and phrases. For instance, this means, you're not telling me the truth. However, the manual alphabet is still used to spell out words for which there are no signs. Have you ever played a game where you were blindfolded and had to make your way around without the use of your eyes? Well, that's what it's like for blind people all the time. But this doesn't mean they can't read. The Braille system is a method of reading and writing by touch for the blind. Braille was devised by Louis Braille, who was blind himself and a teacher of the blind. He invented an alphabet of dots which are raised off the paper Blind people can train their sense of touch to be so acute that they can read by running their fingers over the dots.
Each letter is a different combination of dots, up to three dots high and two dots wide. For instance, this is the pattern for the letter A. Braille can be written using a special punching instrument and paper, or by using a Braille typewriter. Today, there are thousands of Braille books and magazines.